All right, guys, we will call the meeting to order at 6.05. Are there any adjustments to the agenda tonight? All right, um, I'm uh, approved the minutes of Tuesday, September 26th. Can I have a motion? Um, I make motion to approve the minutes. I have um, a comment. Um, I want to bring a little attention to uh, agenda item for minutes 12. It starts off with rain bill moved to exit executive session. And it got a second, we went to public mode. And then there's a motion seconded and a vote, unanimous vote, for those attending of this SU board to approve the um the recommendations out of um the executive committee and i think it's timely to thank everybody and feel thankful that we've got uh, a talented extraordinarily bright committed uh compassionate Superintendent and this superintendent who is sitting two steps, two um, chairs down for me is going to be with us for five more years. Um, and I, I don't know if anything it gladdens my heart more of that thought. Um, when we're facing unbelievable challenges as public school officials in this country and the state to do the very, very, very best, and that starts with the top. And we've got, I believe, in that unanimous vote, I think, shows again, no surprise, that we've got the talent, he's got the team, got the vision, um, and we're planning to get it done. So I, I don't know about you, but I'd just love to be able to... Thank you very much. We did. Jamie did. We did work out a contract with Jamie for the for five years now. So that's for a while. So that's thanks to everybody's input and hard work. And, and Jamie's. And Jamie, so you sure? You sure that's what you want, Jamie? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so don't worry, Patrick. Give me a minute. I'll, I'm sure I'll change his mind. <laughs> We did just get down the policy committee. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you for that, Bill. So, any other discussion on the minutes? All right. Hearing none, so moved. Um, board correspondence and communication. Does anybody have anything? And public comments. Do we have any public on tonight? Do we have a number ending in? Nine six. Do you have public comment? You could, if you're part of public, um, star six to unmute and you have a comment. Okay. Uh, Speak of the devil. Yeah. Thank you to the board. Uh, just to clarify, to remind the board, it's a. Uh, I'm here five years, but year one's right now. Um, He's already shortening it, guys. <laughs> I'm really excited about that. Just to be sure you know. Um, but no, uh, thanks. I, you know, I guess I would, I would say, you know, what a, what a pleasure in regards to working with the boards. And you know, I just had a board retreat last week, and I went home and shared with my, my uh, better half how just excited I was uh, for the work ahead. And, and Rodney was part of that board with the White River Unified District Board. And I felt like there was a lot of really good visioning happening. And I have felt really good about the work that's happening at the board level. And I just want you to know that trickles down into our schools. I had a pleasure of leading a faculty meeting uh, at our high school today around uh, work that we're doing around our proficiency work um, and best looking at how to leverage pathways and support kids and um, make certain we're pro uh, providing appropriate modifications and accommodations if kids need them and so 
what I would say to you is that um, it's a real pleasure. I feel like we have a great team here. Um, our admin team and our, our teachers and our support staff and our custodians and our food service staff are pretty incredible. Um, and, you know, I would say that one of my goals has been to make certain that we are an organization that makes decisions on what best serves kids. And I really feel like you feel that when you walk through our buildings. Um, and so that feels uh, incredibly good. Um, and there's a lot of work to do. Uh, but we got the right team to do it. So I'm really, I'm really pleased with the work. Did we finish approving the minutes? Yes. Okay. I missed that. <laughs> so we're going to uh, have a data presentation for you tonight. Uh, you're going to get the first draft of your budget. We'll rock, walk you through the changes within the budget document um, and some of the whys to that uh, suggested changes. Um, and you know what I would say to, to folks is is that there's a lot happening uh, in the SU right now, but it, it feels like it's it's uh, it's all happening in regards to taking form around um, us best meeting our needs of kids. Like I I feel like we're in the thick of making some significant impacts on student learning, um, and that we are not being uh, mired down in regards to operations. Um, there's operation work happening, but I don't feel like that is taking the majority of our energy right now, which is a good thing as an organization um, when we're able to focus on our number one goal around student achievement and outcomes for kids. So there's always operational work happening behind the scenes, but I, I do feel like in general, a majority of um, the SU's team and, and the focus at the buildings is around uh, instructional outcomes. Um, which is good. That's what we want. Um, and so I'll take any questions folks may have. Uh, I would just add before questions, I'm already starting to really monitor what's happening in Montpelier. Uh, as we come up to the second half of the biennium, I'm, uh, I continue to be uh, concerned around um, what the ed funds yield, what the impact of the ed fund may be around our yield. Um, and also word on the street is that we should expect uh, pretty significant impacts on our common level of appraisals again across the state, meaning that they're going to drop, which both increase what we need to collect for taxes. Yield drops, common level appraisals drop. It means taxes go up. Um, and so, you know, I think there's a lot of work we're going to need to do on these district budgets uh, and on the SU budget to get us where we feel good about them. Um, what you've seen in the first round of budgets is us showing you uh, what desires are in regards to student support. You'll get the rest of your um, FTEs um, and, and all your other support staff and, and instructional staff next month, which is a big chunk of your budgets that we can control. Um, and then we're going to have to really roll up our sleeves and make some informed decisions come December and in January when we look to adopt. But, but I just want you to know that that is something that we are talking about a lot at the admin level, and we will give you information as soon as we get it. Um, and the tough part is, is those two things I just said, CLAs and the yield, we don't get until December. But what I want board members to do is go into this budget cycle knowing that we do not expect those to be as positive as they've been the last few years, specifically the EU. So not to be the bearer of bad news as yeah. we go into the SU budget. We're I just it's something, five minutes ago and now it's just something I want us to really be um, thinking about as we're as we're going, like our trajectory around budget. And I'll take any questions folks may have. Okay. One, uh, hopefully it's not going to be any word on the AOE new. Uh, yeah, no, it's a great question. Yeah, thanks. Uh, uh, I think there's some concern out there that we really need the best we can get to, to move the state and advocate for public education at the legislative level as well as with the governor. Has any um, any word on that? So the word is they're interviewing. Um, you know, I I will say I was just reading an article the other day that I I thought I put it in. I shared this with the admin team perspective around 
the agency of ed and the state board so far has spent five hundred dollars in trying to recruit a secretary of ed and we have some supervisory unions that will spend twenty thousand to recruit a superintendent mm -hmm. so um you know it's it's i don't know what the candidate pool is going to be bill um i would encourage the dsa the vsba and the vpa i do think have done a good job of communicating to the state board the priorities that we're looking for our next secretary of ed um, and that information has been shared with the state board. Um, you know, I think it's one of these positions, you know, it, it works on at the, at the leisure of the governor. Um, and I think, you know, in regards to attracting a full slate of a candidate pool, there is, you know, a worry out there in our field in regards to folks who might have considered that position or post, knowing that where it's not clear whether our governor is running it. So that it's, it could be, you know, or essentially we're looking at just over a year um, in, on the job. And so is that something you'd want to take off, <clears throat> knowing that it could be only a year? Um, and so stay tuned. I, I, I don't know uh, where that's going to go. If you read the governor's letter to the state board, he emphasized, um, at least out of his office, that he didn't feel that, that, that the best candidate necessarily needed educational experience. Um, and that we may be well served um, of someone coming out of uh, possibly the private sector. So, you know, stay tuned um, and we'll see how that plays out. You know, the state board will, the way it works here is the state board will give uh, three candidates for the governor to interview and then the governor will make the decision. I think the, the work for us, though, and what has been advised, at least from Jeff Francis, who's been with the VSA for a very, very long time. For some of you board members, you've probably heard that name before. Um, and, you know, Jeff's advice really is, is that we should be right now really honing in and focusing on the work at hand for us. And um, certainly taking AOE support where we can get it. But I would, I would tell you right now, um, the AOE is in a state of flux. Um, and so, you know, I would say the biggest concern I have from where I sit and I look down at the end of the table is where Tara sits. I am very concerned that we have someone in the fiscal office, Brad James, retiring out of the agency of Ed, who's been there for multiple decades, who really has our funding formulas and how our tax rates work and things on algorithms and spreadsheets that he understands. And I worry about how much of that knowledge uh, has been shared out and systematized. Uh, so that is a worry I have and a worry that I have when I think about the yield, that there could be overcorrections even possibly with the yield to ensure that it doesn't get messed up. So, yeah. Anyways, I'm still not being the bearer of great news, but we got some good academic data coming from I'm here. Coming on the, the staff at the end of the table because so, striking out. Um, I am not all doom and gloom. I started by saying I was really happy about a lot of the instructional things happening, but on that side, uh, we we're going to have to watch it really close. Fair enough. Anything else for Jamie? Okay. We'll focus on things we can control. Over here, I guess. That's right. <laughs> you, you just said you have no gloom and doom, so. No gloom and doom. All right, so we'll skip right to. Uh, so we'll, um, in my report, I, uh, we talked a little bit about data in the first part there. We can get into that when we look at the report. I do think, um, just to further highlight uh, Jamie's comment about instructional practices, we have um, really great instruction happening in our classrooms uh, and we're further bolstering that with this work that we're doing um, with other SUs across Vermont called, called inclusive education practices, also known as universal design for learning, but really thinking about what are those instructional practices that are going to make it um, our education accessible for all students. Um, and we had a session with the, this uh, nationally known um, educator, Dr. Katie Novak, uh, two weeks ago, and then yesterday in our admin team had a chance to sort of then apply it and think about it in our own buildings. And then I met with staff um, principals today who are already thinking about how they're rolling it out to their staff and thinking about um, 
really it gets at that middle line in that second goal about um, how to make sure that our education is relevant, rigorous, and personalized. That's what uh, Universal Design for Learning is doing. So we're, we're the you know the adding this progressive learning again is not something brand new, but really trying to dive at those you know that goal and um, unpack all those pieces. So it's really um, really exciting to see this starts to take off. Um, and be able to highlight where it's already, pieces of it are already happening and thinking about what, different ways to engage our students and where we can get better at it as well. And that looks different in, at different levels and in different schools in terms of areas of strength and uh, areas of growth. Um, and then I think this Friday, I'm always excited about professional learning. So this Friday is the second of our six uh, half day in services that are SUY, where we have our teachers come together from across different schools um, in some sort of job or project to light grouping. Um, so I will be working with the kindergarten through second grade professional learning communities. We'll be talking about um, effective reading um, practices as a whole group, K2, so we think vertically, but then also they'll have time in their individual grade levels. Um, and they've got plans to talk about sort of report cards and scales and looking at student work together and sharing uh, different resources. So it's an uh, exciting way. They, they, oh, it creeps up on us and we've got, what, 26 of them running now, 25 of them running. Um, but I think it's a really good use of, uh, of time um, to uh, get all our folks together. We have a lot of experts in the system. It's great when they can share with each other. So I can take any questions, if there are any questions on that, that part of the report, otherwise we could move to the academic report. Okay. Um, so as we have done, uh, this is the second year where we've had all the schools using the same um, universal screener. Uh, and we use it three times during the year, fall, winter, and spring. Uh, every year we make uh, you know, slight adjustments, whether that's to exactly when we administer it. Um, we've added uh, an additional grade level this fall, which is kindergarten. You did not see kindergarten data last fall. Um, and that's just based on kind of the information that we're getting and working with our teachers um, and making sure it's the most effective. So the first page of the report just tries to give you a lot of information about how we get these scores and what they might mean. Uh, it's probably more than anyone really wants, uh, but I do, I do believe it's better if you're armed with the information rather than, uh, and especially when we're so reactive to colors and you can think, right, like the, just looking at red, just good to know, bring your attention to the yellow. Um, which we call below expected uh, is between the 40th and 59th percentile, and um, you know we want our kids to get up to that 60th percentile and above, um, and to know that nationally, right, that kids are in the yellow may still be comparable to kids in the 50th percentile across the nation, and um, that's not a bad thing. Um, we're going to continue to look to grow it, but we we are really focused in a lot of our conversations with um, teams around what kinds of additional plans do we need. We're looking at those students who are um, well below expected or considered the no red on the, in these uh, reports. Uh, and then I just, uh, I think most important is to think about this is baseline for the year. So we did it within the first six weeks of school, not right when kids walk in the door, but a couple weeks after that. So we get a sense of where they are. Um, and sometimes we'll compare that to where they were in the spring and see how much slide might have we have had between the end of the previous school year and the start of this school year. Some of that slide is also expectations get higher every grade level. So the end of fourth grade does not look exactly like the beginning of fifth grade. There is just, we are, we are assessing on different um, standards and proficiency. So not all, not all lower performance in the fall is about summer slide, though some of it is, if that makes sense. Um, and so we, then we just look at uh, what kind of performance do we have by kind of grade level um, and you know, do we have the right materials instruction happening in each grade level? And then also how is the individual cohort doing? So are they making growth from between first and second grade and then grade second to third grade? So we're both looking at this as like a systems, how's our curriculum instruction going? And then how are students doing um, as a result of that and look at their growth. So that's the ways we look at um, this data in general. We're seeing the kind of growth we want, particularly uh, our early elementary and math there. You can see kindergarten through third grade all making great progress. That number has gotten better, right? Like that, sorry, that grade level has pushed up every year. So last year we saw sort of first and second grade, the gains that we've seen in those earlier grades is now pushing up. We hope to see, continue to see that push up through the upper grades too, as we fill those gaps that have been missed previously because of disrupted learning and maybe instructional gaps. Um, and then we um, we also have to look at the last graph in math around uh, the domains. This is looking at sort of all of the things that we test in math. 
um, by the sub the kind of the, that sub subject within math and see what is it that we may need to be working on um, more consistently either at a grade level or vertically across the system. Um, and different domains are tested in different grade levels. So um, something like card counting and cardinality that's only for, that's only a kindergarten. So we're just looking at that for um, kind of our youngest students, see how they're doing. Expressions and equations, we start testing that in sixth grade. So there are fewer kids, but that looks like it's a big one that we really want to start looking at um, and thinking about if there are ways to um, increase uh, earlier performance to help it, um, improve that one, because that is certainly an area we've got some, some gaps in our. Any questions on math? Justin. Yeah, Justin, thanks. Hey, uh, yeah, thanks. Um, uh, so what is, is this, does this, uh, track my progress, is this, um, are there tests specifically created by, you know, how are these numbers uh, being simulated like this? Is this the test that uh, the program generates, you know, for these children to take, or is this um, school um, test? Oh, okay, thank you, oh, Dustin, thank you. That's a great question. If I understood you correctly, so Track My Progress is the assessment um, company and platform that we use. So they have created these tests. That's the name of the company. So that's what we, that's what we use when we're talking about it. So e everyone across the SU is taking, using the same, the same platform to get these, these numbers. That's why, why they're sort of relatively comparable across. Um, Track My Progress bases the questions on Common Core State Standards and have normed the, the, resp the results across the nation. So that's how we get sort of these national um, national percentile rankings on them. Um, does, that, does that make sense? Yeah. That is, yeah. Okay, thanks. Previously, we used something called STAR 360. There's other kind of platforms out there. This is the one that we use um, across all of our schools. Anything else from math? And, and just so the board knows, one of the reasons we chose Track My Progress was we felt like we could analyze the data in a, in a, in a much more teacher friendly way uh, so the teachers could use that data to inform instruction. Um, it's in the other piece to this too that we've appreciated is track my progress is actually was started locally in the upper valley um, their founder and so I would say that they've tried to work very closely with us to try to adjust if we give them input so. It is a local company as well that now is across the, the country, but um, that's why we chose this vendor. Uh, so starting on page four, we have the, the kind of the same set layout of, of data um, for English language arts. Again, looking at sort of how the entire cohort um, of first graders and second graders and so forth performed this year as compared to last year um, as represented by an average scale score. Uh, what that progress looks like from last fall to this fall. We're looking, you know, we want, we want blue and green. That's, that's good. So the progress, looking at progress there over the course of one academic year is, you know, either meeting or kind of exceeding the expectations for that year across all our grade levels um, with particular growth in the eighth grade. Um, and then looking at how those performance uh, bands for the current fall. So this is again baseline. We'll look at this and see how do we see what's that growth look like um, in expectations, uh, meeting and exceeding expectations, those percentages by the time we get to winter. Um, and then the last one is looking at those individual domains within English language arts. Um, the, you know, the biggest group there that is not yet meeting expectations is in reading foundational skills. That is where, you know, our focus has been over the last uh, year to really um, think about both our materials and our instructional strategies to, um, to make um, significant improvements there. And so we're, uh, we still got work to do. That is assessed K through fifth grade, that, that's that domain. Um, I think we've made a lot of progress K2 and we've got some um, kind of catch up and gap filling work to do in 3 five. Awesome. Any questions, anyone? I had a question. <clears throat> um, last spring, we celebrated the enormous gains of our students um, as measured by Track My Progress, both in math, that originally I thought was our biggest, steepest mountain to climb, and also in and uh, English language arts. Um, 
So then, and the gain was from the fall test results to the spring test results. Now I'm looking at the new fall results. Now, in some ways, you'd say, ideally, the gains we made last spring would remain with us this fall. And you talk about summer slump. Uh, it appears that we don't. And I know uh, this organization spent a lot of time and energy, and we talked about one plan and everything else about having supplemental, proactive, summertime interventions with our kids. Um, so the question, I guess, is it's natural to have a summer sump. Is it also natural that we can look forward to as we go through this year so that we can get back where we were and then hopefully a little even further? Um, if you hear what I'm saying, because last year we were, our gains were over two years in math and, and over one and a half years in English language arts. We're talking about here gains <coughs> averaging about a year. So I'm saying, did we lose a year or is that temporary because we haven't had the face time with these kids, with our teachers and our support staff to get them moving again? So I I think of it in three in three ways. The yep. two right one is the is the there is the summer summer slide that that may happen. I think it's hard to capture exactly what that looks like. Two is the right that we are assessing kids in you know for, for almost every single kid we're assessing on a new set of content in the fall. So they are now right second graders who ended last year are now getting assessed for right now on sort of third grade yes. content. So some right again some of it could be summer slide but some of it is like. We will hear our teachers say, like, I, we haven't even like, taught that yet. <laughs> yeah, that's so that I oh, think that it's the same content. It's not exactly, no. I mean, it's a computer adaptive test and no. that it, it adjusts to what kids know, but there is like it is a third, or at least they start with third grade standards. So, to some degree, right, there's going to be, there's not, it's not, they're not taking the second grade test. And we've talked about this with our teachers too, who have like curriculum based, like, don't give the end of second grade test at the beginning of third grade, give the third grade readiness test so and find out what they what know. They and they don't need know. To, by starting the year and the end of the year. Yeah, some okay. of this, yeah. That's huge for us to understand. And um, I think I'm just slow on that end, but if you could make that clear yep. uh, in your reporting, because um, I've been thinking yeah. about this, thinking about it. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and to me, that makes sense because it's okay if everybody already knows the third grade stuff. And, we that's why I always try to say, them to the fourth grade. Yeah, I always try to say this is baseline and we can do some comparisons because we want to make sure that we're not just like taking it in isolation and it's baseline for this year okay. for that. Okay. The third piece, and I do want to say this, yeah. I also want to be as much as transparent as I had the same wondering because I said I think our progress rates last fall were or last spring <laughs> looked a lot better than they do this fall. And yeah, so I talked I talked to our um the founder over at Track My Progress and they talked to me about why. If our progress rates are all up over one and a half and two, why we're still seeing, you know, a good chunk of kids who are who are not yet meeting expectations. I don't feel like those two data points are talking together. And he advised, and this I'd never heard before a month ago when I started pulling reports, that when we do rate of progress, we should always do it over the course of a year. That's how it's been normed, and that's how they've gotten sort of the bell curve that gets there. So when we look in winter, we will look winter of last year to winter of this year. When we look in spring, we'll go spring of last year to spring of this year. We won't do fall to spring. He said that is, it's not calculated to do it that well. So we won't see that again this year. Correction learned. <laughs> you can do it. The program lets you do it. It lets you set any sort of um, any sort of parameters you want. Um, but that was the guidance that we got this year when I had the same inquiry that you did. Like, why does this not match? Gotcha. So thank you so much. Sure. Always getting better, hopefully. <laughs> All right. Hi. Yeah, I just had a quick follow up to that. Under, um, thank you for this. Thank, uh, spelling it out. This this is the. I've been looking at these numbers for a lot of years, and this is the easiest uh, format to kind of ingest. Um, so thanks. I wanted to touch briefly on the um, the lagging behind of the cohort of third to fifth graders, and ask if that has to do with. Um, Kind of COVID affecting their early elementary education, or if there was any, if that is developmentally a group that tends to have trouble, or if there's something we should be alarmed about there. 
No, so I think when I think about that third through fifth grade, when we're speaking, particularly when we're talking about English language arts, I think of it as is there's there's two main factors that I that we were seeing. I think there is a, a COVID effect of right interrupted instruction in those early years when we are building those foundational skills. Um, we also know that like art, right? Like we we got kids back into school fairly quickly, right? So that, that is not the whole story. The other part of it is that. Um, across all our classrooms, we did not have the emphasis on ensuring that all students were getting um, explicit systematic instruction in those foundational skills like we do now. Um, and so, and we have really, really great materials and instructional strategies around that for, for kindergarten through third grade at this point. There's not as many in those upper grade levels because they think every kid has gotten it, you know, hopefully getting it earlier. So that's a piece where we've been had to be a little bit more creative around making sure that if they're in third, fourth, and fifth and haven't gotten them, that we are sort of figuring out ways to developmentally appropriately bring that into those grade levels. And it has you have to be sometimes a little bit more creative because the instruction is sort of the uh, materials have sometimes already skipped over that. So mm -hmm. that's the place that um, we are working um, kind of more intentionally at the moment. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Alva. Thank you very much. More data coming from Annette. I was just going to say, I'm just going to continue with the, the data talk, uh -huh. if that's OK. Yeah. Um, because, um, you know, as Anda had mentioned, you know, we, we are exploring the Track My Progress program and what it can offer us for data points. And um, so we started playing around with um, just identifying um, scores for students that are serviced via an IEP. Um, and kind of what does that progress look like? We haven't we haven't really explored that much. And so we were we were having fun. Wow. <laughs> so in the in the report you'll see that we, that fall over fall that Anna was just explaining about um, for students that are just serviced via an IEP, and you can notice that um, they are all making, you know, expected, um, and a couple of grades are making above expected progress. So that means what that what that's telling us is that those gaps in their learning are being filled, um, and they're coming into school in the fall with with less gaps, and. Um, so that's something to to celebrate. Um, you know, are are they? You know, some of them, majority of them, still. When you look at the reds and yellows, are they still kind of in reds and yellows? Yes, but their scores are getting higher, and their skills are are growing, and so they are making that that progress that we're looking for. So that's super exciting. Nice um, to hear. So, so just something to add. Uh, to to Anda's um, data presentation. So, any questions? Yeah, we'll keep looking at this throughout. So like when we do winter, we'll we'll try to do like a winter overlay as well, and just kind of see how the pro the progression works. Yeah, I think we're all aware that it's not only the academics, right. um, but when you're able to use <coughs> this you know, testing mechanism that you have confidence in and tested and yeah. get all blue or green i mean that's yeah. that's um we're in that upward really trend that's what we want is that's what we trend. want um yes. and i have to think that uh, yes. when kids do better and adults do better and yes. they are somehow can measure it and got them they feel better and when mm -hmm. they feel better then that that multiplies and it goes down the road so i think this is, are you going to continue to do this? That's uh, our hope is that and, and when you see winter, we'll do a winter to winter overlay and same in the spring. Well, so, since that's the recommended from the company is to do that. Yeah. So you all have my report. It outlines mm -hmm. what's happening in the business office during the month of November. Um, an update I wanted to give. Um, just actually as a reminder, as we're going into the budget season, as you know, we start with your student support, go to your general education, mm -hmm. and then we slowly start to build in the rest of it. And then in December, you also see your revenue budget. So our districts who were receiving the small schools grant, which was changed to the merger incentive grant, if you merged, 
um, will actually be going away for all of our districts as a result of the new rating study. That was part of um, Act 127. So with the increase in the long-term waiting amounts, it actually does also take away that um, small school merger incentive revenue stream for us. So that will be something you will see zeroed out on your <coughs> revenue budget when the time comes for those in December. So I hate to piggyback on Jamie's news, but I just we didn't want anyone to lose sight of that or to be surprised when that comes out in my board report and you see that it's just a reminder that that did go away with Act 127. Question. Um, does that offset the positives we got in the new way, weighing formula? Because I was under the impression we were, as a supervisory union, came out ahead on that. Well, uh, did we lose it all it on this? It depends on the district. Huh? Depends on the district. Oh, it depends. Some districts are still going to come out ahead. Some districts, we have some concern. Thank you. And then I'll answer any additional questions there are on my report. Otherwise, I'll come back and do the overview on the first draft of the budget and then let each um, department administrator discuss their changes. All right. Thank you, Ted. Your turn. Okay, as I uh, bring up my report here, um, we had uh, a very exciting uh, last minute change on the PSAT. All uh, new, all digital this time, and not for technology reasons, but for test administration reasons. That got moved to the law school on Thursday or a Tuesday, where Monday was a holiday. <laughs> um, and uh, we were talking about waiting. So uh, coming up uh, in December, you'll see uh, uh, enrollment data. ABM is uh, my focus for the next month, give or take. Um, I don't have anything to share yet. And then uh, lots of other projects going on, including uh, HVAC controller work in Rochester, Bethel, and Tunbridge, which uh, requires some coordination between my department and that, those vendors. I would uh, field any questions from our virtual or in-person participant. Thank you, Rick. Yeah, so uh, Haley was planning to be here tonight, um, but is uh, feeling under the weather. So uh, Haley provided you a written report uh, in regards to our one plan and after school programming, uh, you know, I would say in I'm really pleased where we're at within our after school programming, considering the challenges across the state that systems continue to see in regards to hiring. Um, and, you know, we've been working hard to get uh, community members back into our buildings to help offer programming. Um, that is one of the areas where we have felt like it, we've struggled since COVID is to get folks who typically worked in our after school programs to come back in. Uh, but it is outreach we've been trying to do through our community schools work. Um, and so what you'll see here is the offerings we have. Um, and then what I'm really excited about is through our community school grant, we've been offering middle school programming via clubs. Um, now at all of our middle schools, there's that we started it last year at the middle school in Bethel. Um, and now there are clubs happening at first branch after school for middle school students. And we've now started it at the Newton school as well. And we'll continue to expand that. And there is a goal to add middle school to our 21 C application next year so that we have funding that can support this notion of clubs at the middle school level. And we use clubs because uh, one, it is a club. Yeah, some of them offer are offered multiple days a week or some are offered just one day a week. And we don't require, uh, students can decide to sign up for just one club. It's not like in one planet where you tend to sign up for the week. Um, and we have found that that has met the middle school need 
um, well. And it's, it's probably a celebration of learning that we should bring to the full board um, at that middle school level because I've been really impressed um, around how engaged our middle schoolers have been with clubs. Uh, for a long time, um, I think schools have struggled with what can you provide for after school programming for middle school students that's actually engaging and gets them to want to stay outside of the typical extracurriculars or co-curriculars we may think about in regards to drama um, and athletics and things of that nature. And I think we've come up with some that seems to really capture them. So in hearing the students talk about it has, was, has been pretty powerful. Uh, Anna and I got to be part of a visit from the Agency of Ed at our middle school in Bethel last year and hearing our students talk about the after school clubs and what that means to them was um, it was it was moving. Uh, so I think it would be good to bring that to the full board so you could hear about that middle school programming. Um, so I'll work on that for next month. Um, and. Uh, so yeah, we're looking to build that. So it's something that you know the community school grant has been supporting, but we'll look to uh, transition that to a 21 century grant so that we have the funding to keep making that possible without um, having to uh, budget in your local districts. Jamie, can I just add one thing that we've talked about before? Is the, part of the success of that too is um, how much our staff are willing to lead lead those. Yes. And that's not always easy, right? To do that on top of the rest of your day. Um, but our, our kids are are already and so i mean sometimes it's great to see someone new and sometimes they've been already connected to that person in the school but seeing them you know in cooking club rather than in um <clears throat> like reading intervention but it's just i it's just an opportunity just to thank our you know our educators and our staff who um do sign up to do that um and offer that because it, it would be a harder to staff if we were trying to do that entirely with brand new and external people all right well, policy committee update wants to take it. Stacey, you want to take it? Uh, sure. So the policy committee is rigorously going through a very well-linked Google spreadsheet um, to compare the policies that the board has uh, written over the past five years with uh, updated policy language from the uh, So we began that work tonight. We are starting with some of the staff policies um, and we've been them as they come. Um, clearly, if uh, there are grammatical or smaller changes, um, we're just going to um, tidy those up. But if and when we find substantive uh, changes in policy that's been made or um, updates that affect the nature of policy itself, we will have to read those. So you should expect uh, some updates coming your way very soon. Anything Thanks. I've missed? Eric? So, so one thing that we talked about that um, I think would require would be helpful to have the sense of the board, the full board, is on the format of the policies. The, the policies currently um, start by saying it is the policy of the either the, um, the district or, or the supervisory union to X. Um, and um, there are a number of us, I think just two, but anyway, a number of us within the um, committee that feel that that is um, officious surplus language <laughs> and that we ought to just simply um, say, say what the policy is without having to, um, to, to, to you know, glorify it or make it sound like really, really official because it, it's not necessary. Um, and before we undertake to, to change every policy to, um, to be, from my, my perspective, what is plain English, uh, I think that the, the the committee felt that it would be helpful to hear from the full board. So my perspective is if it's not a change that we have to warn every policy and bring it back, if it winds up just being a substantive change, um, then um, I, I think it makes sense to make, make them all um, unified, uni uniform, and start out the same way. Yes, and just to follow that briefly, um, you know, in addition to it being, you know, officious and kind of blow hard language, in the three policies we looked at tonight, uh, it was inconsistent. So um, cleaning those up just for consistency would be great. And to, to back with our lawyer to make sure that that language can be changed without it constituting 
uh, a substantive change. Andrew? Um, could you provide maybe for next meeting or something, an example of how you would phrase it so that we can kind of see what you're picturing versus what we currently have? I think we can do that right now. If you give me two, two seconds. Got to open up a document. Sorry. This is unfortunately the benefit of being remote and having the computer in front of you is I can actually do this at the same time. Uh, so for example, substitute teachers, it's policy B1. Um, <coughs> the policy starts by reading, it is the policy of the White River Valley Supervisory Union and its member school districts to employ substitute educators who will meet the minimum qualifications outlined by Vermont Standards Board of Professional Educators Rule 5380. So rather than it starting by, it is the policy of the White River Valley Supervisory Union, um, <clears throat> it would read the White River um, Valley Supervisory Union and its member uh, school, school district shall employ substitute uh, educators who meet the mini minimum qualifications. That's, that's the uh, language change. So it's just taking out an, a sentence that seems like redundant. Because it is, I mean, the document is the policy, uh, uh, and the policy statement is on the first portion of the document. You, you don't have to announce to the world that this is a policy. Yeah, that's a good change. Anybody have any issues with that change? Because that way, if the policy committee goes back to do their work. We know that the board supports us making that change. And we are going to check with legal to make sure we don't have to warn everyone to make those kind of changes. Okay. Seems nobody has any issues with that. All right. Anything else for the policy committee, guys? Feel free to drop in and hang out with us anytime yeah. we have a meeting. Uh -huh. 530 right before this one. We'd love to have your input. As always, it's the most fun meeting. It is the best. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, we are on to discussion item draft number one of the 24-25 budget. So just a couple of reminders. Those of you who have already seen draft one in your, your individual districts, you know my spiel on what we're using for numbers. But for those who haven't been, um, for health insurance, I won't know until the end of this month, beginning of next month exactly how Visbit filed their rates and what they're looking for through conversations at my VASBO meetings. Um, VHI has indicated that it will be a substantial increase higher than they wanted. So as you may recall, last year was 12.7% was the average increase. So I used 13% increase in the first draft of the budget to make any necessary adjustments once I have the actuals from VHI Blue Cross Blue Shield. On the dental insurance, I'm using 5%, same thing there. As soon as I know what those rates are, I'll make any additional adjustments. And then the way I set this up is similar to the way that you see the budget document as we get to the full. So first we have the central office and then we have special education based on the fact that we have two different assessments. So that's the way I also broke up this first draft, um, similar to follow along with the way that the main budget does as well. Broken down by department. Um, I'll take the lead when people can talk. Sorry. Um, so uh, tonight, essentially what you're looking at in regards to central office, and you will get the full line by line expenditure budget um, next month. Uh, but tonight we just focused on personnel. And so uh, what you're seeing in central office is essentially the in an increase in FTE of 1.75, but really it's, it's 1.5 um fts that we're looking to bring in and there's the point the point two five in regards to leadership uh in the curriculum area you'll notice that's your second one that says 1.35 that point two five is to cover the remainder that we need to cover of michaela martin's salary that's not part of esser moving forward so that's our intensive programming system support coordinator position at the su level and part of her salary is also in special ed because she does both. 
She works in curriculum and works in special ed to really help within our system bring those two together. So that salary is in here and you'll see it in both of those areas. Um, so I wanted to mention that. The other 1.5 FTEs that we're looking to increase is the other one is our community school coordinator, which is Mary Shell. She's been covered by the community school grant. The White River Unified District, uh, that grant was um, secured by our middle school in Bethel. And the focus of that grant was on the middle school year one. Year two was to focus on the middle schools in the high school. And year three is to focus on all of our schools across the supervisory unit. Um, and we've been using funding via that grant to support schools across the supervisory union. So when you think about clubs happening, those clubs in first branch in Newton are being covered by that grant that we were able to secure. Um, at our elementary schools, it's helped cover some um, other activities around enrichment. Uh, an example is that community school grant in Rochester Stockbridge is going to help cover um, to, for us to repave the skate rink. Uh, in Rochester for their skate park that's used by the community. Um, and it's also funded uh, all of our community conversations and things of that nature. Um, and so half of that salary and benefits has been carried via the grant, the other half by the White River Unified District. Mary's schedule really is half time employed by Rudd and then is also helping provide some support for our other schools around community connections like we're having a math night in first branch tomorrow. Mary Shell works with our principals and teachers and things to make that happen. Um, and so we're looking to continue to fund that community school coordinator. Um, Mary has also uh, played a role in us getting our maker spaces up and rolling here in this upcoming year to support our students at the middle school levels. Um, and for you know next year moving forward, uh, that community school coordinator will continue to help us with community outreach and supports at each one of our buildings. But also, um, we have a big task in regards to our capstone projects that we're going to be looking to leverage as a um, way for us to authentically assess our kids at the end of um, either elementary or middle school or high school. That's part of our strategic plan. And in order to do that, we're going to need community engagement and support around mentoring our kids. Um, and so that position will be helped to support that moving forward as well. Um, and I've been linking in the community school page on our SU website uh, into my reports. If you haven't had a chance to look at it, please visit it. And it'll show you all the work that we're trying to do in regards to truly becoming community schools. So that's part of where that increase in the SU budget comes from. The other part is, is that, and if you read my report, you'll see, um, we are looking to support within the technology department, a data um, assistant. We've currently carried a $10,000 stipend to do data work in the SU. Uh, instead of carrying a stipend, we're looking to bring somebody in full time to do that work. And if you say, well, what would a data assistant do? A data assistant, I really see wears two hats. One, it helps support central office admin in regards to all the state reporting we have to do, which annually becomes uh, more and more tedious in regards to what we have to report to the agency. Two, as we're trying to, to best leverage uh, platforms like you heard me talking about EduClimber and things of that nature, it does require us to still update EduClimber on a regular basis, meaning weekly, so that when our teachers sit in teams, they have up-to-date attendance data, up-to-date behavioral data, up-to-date any type of academic testing data that we do um, at their fingertips. We've been currently asking Ray to do that. Um, and it really, you know, as we've met in budget conversations, it has become clear to me that it's high time that we support uh, Ray's department and on does. Um, and this person will help in the business office too um, with this data reporting as it becomes more and more intense um, here because we're trying to use data better, but 
but also as the agency just continues to ask for more reports on a regular basis. Um, so that's the big changes in regards to the top part of the budget. It's, it's bringing Mary Shell in full time um, off of that community schools grant. Like I said, Rudd already supports 0.5 of that position. They have been. It would be looking to the SU to support the other half of that position. That's, and when you see that figure, that's full salary and benefits. That's not just salary. That's everything rolled up in these departments. Um, and then, like I said, it is really to bring in that 1.0 uh, data assistant of which um, I want to hear the board's feedback on because I actually believe um, we should be looking to try to search for someone to possibly start this year in that role because um, I don't want I, I'm not speaking for my team. I'm just saying I think um, I'm asking them to burn the candle at both ends pretty significantly in this work. Um, and I'd like us to try to fix that. And some of it I did not predict to be uh, as intense as it is this current fiscal year. So if the board was supportive of this, I would say to the board that you would be looking for us to try to figure out how we're going to fund it and make it happen this year without going over budget. Um, and and then in special education services um what you're seeing is our slps that's i don't believe that's any fte change that's just what we've got just currently with salary and benefits yeah, um, just, well, i hired a really experienced um slp which raised up the budget yeah <laughs> We always budget on what we have for staffing in the future year, and then sometimes people leave, and then they have to hire, and then we change it the following year. Uh, the really the the big change here is you'll see it in OT. Yes. We currently in when you see your full budget, this will be offset some by contracted mm -hmm. services. So we currently have 1.8 FTE, and we have to contract with folks to provide other services. Mm -hmm. This is us our attempt to not have to contract services and try to bring the equivalent of an additional 1.2 in so that they actually work for us. We're hopeful of that. I will tell you, we're gonna budget accordingly to try to do that. That doesn't mean we're gonna find them. And it may mean we have to continue to contract. But it's our hope. The same thing uh, with the behavioral analysts. Uh, we've contracted some services for that at the SU level. We are looking to bring that person in. It'll allow us to leverage our Medicaid funds to pay for that position because there's no build down on Medicaid uh, there. And also we'll use some of our, our grant funding through special ed. Mm -hmm. It's called the block grant now. Again, we're going to try to hire that. It doesn't mean we're going to find it. And we may be back to having to contract services there too. Um, but the goal would be to try to have those positions work for us so we can maneuver accordingly um, and not, not have to rely on multiple people that have to do some of that work um, and be able to have, you know, somebody that's like set for right. us that and not having to contract services and have a, a piece of people at different districts. Mm -hmm. So those are the big changes there. And like I said, that behavioral analyst, you're gonna see some offsetting revenue mm -hmm. to help cover that. So those are the big changes. I don't know, Annette or Rhonda, if you wanna add anything else. I mean, I or Ray, um, those, are, those are like, those are the FT changes. What you will see here, and which the board has, we've talked about in the past was this concept of a chief operations officer. Um, and frankly, I don't I don't see where we can necessarily support that right now. Yeah. I was gonna ask you about that. So that is not budgeted for, it's not budgeted for, cause I'm concerned that the SU budget's up already. Um, and we do carry some building cons consult time <clears throat> in there, you'll see. We're carrying $26,913. I just, you know, I'm looking for direction of the board, seeing that number at the top up that much already worries me because I do think we still have, excuse me, constituents that will go into our, 
our mailers and look to just see what the bottom line of the SU is up or not and vote sometimes based on that. I think we're getting farther away with that. I think we've built more trust with our communities. I think people get a better sense of what the SU is doing, but it's already up quite a bit. And I would say to you, like, you know, I look at where's going to be the biggest impact for kids and, and, you know, we are working hard at managing our buildings. We're using some like consultation around it. I'm certainly putting quite a bit of effort in it. I also think our teachers really need ready and available data to make informed instructional decisions. So if you said to me, why are you supporting data versus that? That would be why. One of, one of the things we talked about, uh, I'll, get, I'll grab you just a sec, sir. One of the things we talked about when we were talking about um, viewing your contract, Jamie, is we wanted to, to possibly try to fill that, fill a position for an operating to put you I, I back on the totally other Totally agree. Of the job, so. I know we've talked about it. That's why I brought it and up. We, we all talked about it as a board. So, um, Sarah? Well, and I, you know, what I understand that we're, you know, we're in the business of educating kids, having buildings that work and are efficient is important to that process too. And we, I mean, many of our buildings are fairly old and they're going to need, I, I mean, I just, you know, are we uh, paying Peter to whatever that saying is to, uh, yeah, whatever. Um, and, and so I, I mean, I'm, I'm wondering if maybe we should put it in now so that we can pull it out later if we need to, but. You know, we could certainly add that position and then next month we're, I mean, we got a couple more drafts of this. So we could certainly put in a position like that next month with the rest of the budget lines. And then you can see what does that mean for the overall budget? And we probably could even start to give you a sense of what does that mean for assessments at your district level? And I, I would wonder how how um, having someone who oversees our buildings might, in the long run, save us money. I uh, yes, this is. I wanted to talk this through, and I just said I did not feel comfortable doing it right now because I felt like it's already a bit sticker sharp compared to what budgets we've given you in the last few years at the SU level. So, but Sarah's saying uh, with long term goals, would we? We, we save money in the this, I mean, yeah, I mean, I would tell you, like, we're talking about two possible uh, within the SU right now. We're talking about um, two possible bonds in the next 12 months to vote on. That position would be busy. Yes, Sarah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I mean, I would right now before putting it in, I mean, it's sort of like my you know, getting the Sears wish book, you know, and adding what I want. And then when it comes down to brass tacks, then we can look at it and, and make some adjustments um, if we need to. But I think that's a really, I mean, there are, for me on a lot of different levels, that's an important position to have. Um, I, I agree with Sarah. I would like to see it in. And if we have to cut it at the end, because we all talk about it, it doesn't seem to work. Start there with it and hope that we can do it. Eric? Uh, I agree with the notion of adding it in. I would suggest that one of the things that would be helpful, um, there's actually two things that would be helpful. One is to, to be able to um, create the narrative um, that that allows us to easily explain to the taxpayer what, what the value is that is being uh, created by these positions and value can be actual educational improvement. I'm not, I'm not suggesting that, that it's just a monetary value, but to the second point, um, which is, I, I mean, I look at the 13.75% uh, increase in one area and I, and I hear the, the, the fact that, you know, we have grants that are, you know, expiring and that we are looking at a, a potential yield um, and an assessment that's that's going to be negatively impacting the district as a whole. Sorry, the the union as a whole. Never mind individual districts. And um, I, I worry um, at the end of the day, um, sort of what the big picture will look like. So, long story short, it should be added. We need to be conscious as um, as we identify these issues uh, to, to create the priority list. Um, so, so that um, at the end of the day, we understand consciously what, what it is that we are agreeing to or not agreeing to. 
Anyone else? Okay. Any other discussion on what the budget that Jamie's gone over for us? I, I just wanted to add, I wanted to put a huge shout out to Annette's department with regards to special services, that if you do some research on other supervisory unions around the state, you're gonna find that, that that number over the last few years has been incredible and that our work, our early intervention work in MTSS is paying off. Um, you know, because my sense is that you're gonna find that that number tends to be quite high. So just wanted to take an opportunity to do that. Thank you. All right. What are folks, I am looking for some thoughts around this data position. And we can have a job description for you to look at next month. Um, we were not ready to pull that off this month, but um, I'm just getting a sense if that's something folks want us to put the time and effort in on sharing that job description with you next month so that we could possibly look to try to move forward on that. I, I say I'm in support of it. Does anybody have any thoughts? I'm not sure if it's the job description that is most helpful as much as um, sort of a, a, a baseline understanding of um, a the need and B sort of in a, in a visual form the the need and and how the the position um, fills that need in a way that creates value for for the for the um, supervisory union and the individual districts I think that that's would be what, what would be most for me anyway most helpful Everybody's in support of then Jamie bringing us more information for the position and the job description so that we could possibly get it out. Um, everybody approves to fill that position this fall. Let's get it started this fall. Well, we'd advertise if we found the right person. Okay. Amy? Um, yeah, I was moving on to another question on the budget. So um, if want to finish the discussion on the um what you're discussing on or if you're ready to move on nope go ahead okay um the community school coordinator um i understand that it was previously covered um are you saying that uh, a portion of this uh coordinator's salary is also in a district budget correct is it half of it? Did you say 0.5? Is this a 0.1 or a 1.0 position? It's a 1.0 position. Yep. Okay. And this is a single person, and um, this, these numbers are um, the total package, including insurance and, and all that. Yep. Salary, benefits, everything. Yep. Wow. Okay. Out of 0.5, FTE. 0.5 here. 0.5 is the other place. Correct. That's that is large number it was a little shocking yeah well i think it's just important for folks to remember that health insurance is is large you yeah. and you'll see in some of these budget items where they go up and down um, based on what plan they take um, can impact it yeah i believe tara at one point said it could be up to twenty five thousand dollars the family plan is twenty eight thousand right now. Yeah, that's that's big. So and I, and I do appreciate that we uh, budget for it just because it could possibly happen. Any other discussion on the budget? Any other feedback? Any other options we want um, Jamie to run with um, for us for the next time we see it? Okay. Have a plan? Yeah, good direction. Thank you. Finalize a board retreat date. And um, 
for those of us that were going to attend, I'm sorry that we canceled the, the other night, but it was going to be barely a quorum, if a quorum, and it didn't seem to make sense. Um, I think more numbers would be make it a much better event for us and we would get much more work done. It's hard if only eight or nine people are in the room talking about a board of 28. Um, so it would be nice to get at least to the halfway point with this. Um, but if all the boards get full membership because they want to get a prize, then we'll have 28, won't we? <laughs> um, we didn't pick an exact date. I know we tentatively talked about next week, which next week got here really fast and we didn't talk about it more. Um, do we want to try to do something? Boards. So I've heard from some of Sharon and I've heard from Rudd. If we were going to do next week, though, and members of those boards speak up if I got this wrong, but the 30th seemed better than other dates next week, which is a Monday. Which is a Monday. Uh, um, how many people here could make it on Monday the 30th? What time? 5.30? Come on, Dustin and Eric. <laughs> Eric's got his thumb up. Eric's got his thumb up. Okay, sorry, I didn't see it. <laughs> and Dustin, yes. Yeah. Right. Let, the record, let the record reflect that my chair um, is uh, unable to support the members of her uh, district by not seeing their thumbs up. <laughs> uh, that's because your name on my computer was where your thumb was guys this meeting is in person only um just because um and there'll be dinner we'll have dinner there. Um, get your board members there because there'll be a prize chris does monday work for you still andrew can you do monday yeah. Andrew. Andrew said yes. Andrew said yes. Yeah, I'm hoping I'm hoping I can make Monday work. Okay. All right, we'll roll with it. I'll get right, it more. Right tomorrow. here in the right here, but what we have yeses on is more than we had that could have made it to the previous meeting. So Yeah, it's important. Um it's a good meeting. We had our retreat and we got to know each other better. We started kind of coalescing as a as a team, and then we set a mechanism uh, going forward to establishing our SU board goals. We'll have a fun trivia and, uh, warm up. Thing. So we can build on all that uh, mm -hmm. starting again this coming Monday night. So I, um, it's important we can do it and it makes a difference. So look forward to seeing everybody there. That's yeah. the high school, right? <laughs> yep, at the high school. Last year we played trivia, warm up trivia. Before we got started, we broke up into teams. We had candy for prizes and we had a really good dinner and we did a lot of good conversation happened there. So I hope everybody will get excited and, and come. All right. Um, any right. action items? Any public comment? Any resignation new hires? Any other business? Future agenda items? You know, do we want to set our December meeting um, date before December fills up really quickly? Oh, yeah, because we're going to be usually. Well, it's, it would be set for the 26th, huh? 26th. <laughs> Is that bad for people? <laughs> I won't be there on the 26th. Uh, that I sounds like a great day for it. I won't do the 26th. Can we do the 19th? Yep. We'd be the 19th, right? Oh, everybody. Boy River. What's that? It's not Boy River would be the 19th, right? Right where it would be. I don't think that's yeah, all the, there. All that's all right. this. Yes, that's not right. Not no, those are not corrected there. No, because the 28th is not a Tuesday. That should be a Thursday. We haven't changed the. Well, it's halfway through the draft. Well, no, the 28th. We didn't move the board pieces, the dates that will be.
the, the 28th is a Tuesday. Right. And the 28th like, of December is a Thursday. December 28th. That's, no, that's November. December. December. Oh, December. Sure that December. Sure okay. that. The numbers are The numbers are right. The, numbers are right. Yes. 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 the board meetings are the not The board meetings are not correct. Okay. So Tuesdays are booked. Yeah. So the 19th will have meetings on it. Um, so if the full board wanted to go that week prior, they could do the Monday the 18th. I can do the 18th. So can I. Amy can. Eric can. Stacy. Patrick. Andrew. Andrew. Right. All right so and, and thank you for picking up on that, Sarah, because that's an important meeting. We usually try to adopt the SU budget that night. Yeah. In December. Yep. Um, I would also uh, append that, amend that by append that by uh, proposing that we go ahead and move the policy committee meeting that month to that date as well. Yes. Monday. 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 Monday.